weekend, actually, was it last weekend? No, two weekends. No, last weekend. I met the fellow that wrote the song, What a Beautiful Day for the Lord to Come Again. Has anybody ever heard that song? What a Beautiful Day for the Lord to Come Again. That uh, Today, actually, really qualifies for that. You know, uh, I've heard preachers say that they would want to be in the pulpit when the Lord comes back or, or when He calls them, you know, the moment they die, whatever. I hope that God doesn't do that to you all today. Uh, that's up to Him, you know. Um, yeah, I, uh, uh, I had a birthday this weekend, so did Sister Marshall. That wasn't our anniversary, by the way. Uh, for those of you who don't know, our birthday is a day apart. And uh, I was telling someone just a little bit ago, I thought that always worked to my advantage. Because my birthday's first, and then it's her birthday. Uh, today it got me drunk. I don't know how that happens. Uh, but anyway, uh, our, our anniversary is in January. So I know after the ball drops, I've got almost 23 days uh, to get things together to get my anniversary present and card ready. So. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, when you come to church, obviously you're going to hear a message from the Word of God. And in some churches, uh, you know, they feel like the, all they can preach on is is is, is uh, just salvation messages. Which I, I'll be honest with you, when you preach the Bible, uh, you're going to get to Jesus. There's no two ways about it. And uh, some people say, well, you haven't got time to preach doctrine on Sunday morning, preacher. Then pray tell. Then what do you preach if you don't preach doctrine? Doctrine is from Genesis to Revelation. It's the teachings of the Word of God. And some people go further and say, well, you're not really, you don't have an opportunity, a good opportunity on Sunday mornings to teach your distinctives. You know, what, what separates you from others. Well, here again, um, we believe that the Bible distinctives are our distinctives. Uh, if they're not, then we need to find another book or find something else to do on Sunday. You know, so we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to talk about the church a little bit. Sometimes people are questions, have questions about the church. Um, you know, there are a lot of teachings out there that the church is something that you belong to the moment that you're saved. And that's not a biblical teaching. A church is something that you are added to after you're saved, once you follow the Lord in baptism, and join the New Testament church. A church is a local, visible body of believers that have come in together to do the Lord's work. And somebody will say, well, that's old-fashioned. That's old. Well, that's Bible. I don't know what to tell you. Um, a lot of people think that they're a member of this big mystic church. I'm here to tell you the moment that you're saved, you become a member of the family of God. Amen. If you know Christ as your Savior, uh, then you're my brother, you're my sister. There's no two ways about that. But we're not all members of the same church. Right. Uh, as a matter of fact, is anybody, if anybody come in from the north uh, off of 50, you'll see that you passed a church on the way here. It's called Midway Missionary Baptist Church. They believe like you. They're in our fellowship. We, we, we have a fellowship because we, we believe the same things. But Midway is a church, and Bay Lake is a church. And uh, that's, that's the way it works in the Bible. A, bi a, a church is always local and visible. <coughs> And it goes back to uh, what the word in the Greek is called ekklesia. It's called out from. It's an assembly. So it's a group of people that have to be able to come together. And uh, so, uh, you know, when people ask why do you uh, practice communion the way you do when it's only members, well, we believe that's the Bible. Uh, we believe that's what the Bible teaches. We, we don't do that to single anybody out and, and, and say that, you know, hey, we don't want you here. That's that's our conviction of what the Bible says. And I know that you would want us to teach what we believe the Bible says. So, you know, some of those things don't often get said uh, in, in the pulpit. And, and if it hasn't been said here, then that's my fault. Uh, those things need to be said from time to time. So that people, when they come in, they say, okay, well, there's a sign out there that says, Bay Lake Missionary Baptist Church. Well, we know what kind of church we're going into. Which, oh boy, here we go. I had a soapbox this morning. I tried to stay off of it. But we got places today that they put signs up. You don't even know what they are or if they're a church. They're just a, a community, a fellowship. or uh, and, and they're not even called Baptist or Methodist or Pentecostal anymore. They're just called whatever. Whatever fellowship. I guess that 
means that that's a Christian church? I don't know. I, there are people even within our work that uh, they say they're Baptists, but they don't want to call themselves Baptists anymore because, well, we don't want to we don't want to turn anybody away. But that's who we are, right? I mean, that's I, I, well, I can't help that. I was born April twenty seventh. 1950. <laughs> My name on the certificate was Daryl Edward <coughs> Sheely. That's who I am. Okay? Mom and Dad gave me that name. <coughs> Mom gave me that name because there was not another soul in our family named Daryl. She took one look at that and she said, there ain't another one of them anywhere close. <laughs> so, but Edward is my dad's first name. But that's who I am. And you know, uh, when I come to Bay Lake, there were no Sheelys here. And uh, there were four of them after we got here. And, but I didn't change my name. I didn't, I, well, you know, maybe they don't like Sheelys there. If they don't like Sheelys there, you had a vote on that almost 19 years ago. You should take care of it then. But the fact of the matter is, is that we are a missionary Baptist church. That's just what we are. So when you come in here, you ought to expect to hear what missionary Baptists believe. Amen. Okay? And I'm not trying to be arrogant. I'm not trying to be uh, 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 too uh, uh, high-minded. Whatever the case is, I'm just trying to be honest with you. That's who we are. And you've chosen to come here today to see what we're about. That's great. I think we owe you the honesty of telling you who we are. And being right up front with you. Right. You know, as opposed to trying to make you like us based on what you think we might be. Okay? So, as we look at the church today, in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus. And he's, uh, you know, uh, he is help setting some things in order, complimenting them on some things, and, and telling them about some other things they need to do. But he's writing to this church, and the church at Ephesus was in a, in a big, big city for that day. And the city was very worldly for the lack of a better term. Uh, they worshipped all kinds of idols and all kinds of gods and all kinds of whatever. And anything went in Ephesus. I mean, uh, there was really, for some people, there was nothing that was wrong. Okay? Uh, so being a, a New Testament church in Ephesus had its challenges, much as New Testament church in the world has today. But Paul still reminded them. He says, you know, you folks... Jesus Christ left his New Testament church here when he went back to be home so we might get into the world. Right. But what has happened is that in the last 2,000 years, somehow the backflow valve on the church has not been working. And the world has gotten into the church. And it seems like we're more concerned about what they think of us. Well, the apostles were dealing with a group of people shortly after the day of Pentecost, and they were told they were not allowed to preach in the name of Jesus the Nazarene. And they basically said, would you rather us please God or men? That's a question we have to ask ourselves every day. Amen. Are we going to please God or are we going to please men? Even ourselves. Okay? So when we look here at this passage of Scripture, we're going to talk about the church. We're going to talk about three things that the church does. And... Uh, Again, just to be right up front with you, so you know where, where we're coming from, where, where we're going, you know. Uh, but first of all, we see in Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 11, and I am not there at all. I am busy talking in this sermon. Ephesians chapter 4, and verse 11, that'll give you a chance to get there if you haven't got there yet. <coughs> The Bible says here, beginning in verse 11, <clears throat> and uh, he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. We're going to stop right there, have a word of prayer, and then we're going to commence. Our Heavenly Father, pray, Lord, that today your word goes forth and your word goes forth as you would have it to be preached. Lord, use me as an instrument. Uh, in your hands today. God, we have folks here today that do not know Jesus Christ as their Savior. I pray that today your Holy Spirit would convict them and show them their need for a Savior in their life. Father, show them what they have waiting them if they do not trust Jesus Christ 
as their Savior. God, I'm thankful for each and every one that's here, our visitors, our members, those of our membership who haven't been able to be here because of, of health issues. God, we're glad to have them back. Lord, today, I pray that this message would fall upon uh, receptive ears and hearts. God, that we would know uh, exactly what you would have us to be and what you'd have us to do. We love you and pray that we show it. Help us to serve you in this world until you return. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we look here at the first two verses, uh, we see that Paul has said that, that the Lord has given uh, some things to the church uh, for them to work and for them to function. And it says that he gave some apostles and some prophets. Uh, there was definitely a time when early on there were apostles. Paul was an apostle. But the apostles ended with John. Uh, when John died, there were no more apostles. And I know that's uh, different than some people's understanding, but an apostle had to be one that had seen the risen Christ. And uh, there hasn't been anybody here recently that's seen the risen Christ. Because he hadn't come back. Okay? He hadn't, back, he hadn't come back yet. He said, you know, why, why, men, why you men of Galilee stand here gazing? You know, the Lord will return in the same manner as he has gone in the clouds. Well, he hasn't come back yet. So there's no one alive today that would qualify to be an apostle. And uh, as we move on, we see that it says uh, uh, apostles and uh, prophets. Okay? Now, this I know this is going to rub some people the wrong way too, but there are no prophets today. Right. The Bible is our prophecy, right. our book of prophecy. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 1 that God, who in sundry times and divers manners, revealed basically himself unto the fathers by the prophets, but in these last days has revealed us unto himself by his Son. Okay? Jesus Christ is what this whole book is about. It's who this whole book is about. So, if you got somebody that's giving you some kind of prophecy and it don't line up to this book, you need to get away. You need to get away, because God will not contradict this book in any way, shape, or form. You know, there are hordes of people throughout this world that are following somebody that says, well, I've got a vision that God wants you to do something. All right? And does the book say to do that? If it don't, we ain't doing it. Okay? So he goes on to say, and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers. We do have evangelists that, that share the gospel of Jesus Christ. The word evangelist comes the same word evangelize. Okay? That's being done. There are pastors. Okay, there are pastors. You've got one standing before you today. And teachers. Folks, uh, teachers are so important when it comes to the Bible. You know, we have a Sunday school hour before this hour. And I realize that, uh, you know, that, that's an extra hour out of your time. And I'm not trying to be sarcastic or, or, or mean or anything here. But I want you to consider, is that 45 minutes that they get to spend with a teacher in the Bible worth it to your children? When they're getting innumerable hours of other kind of information from other places all week long. Mm -hmm. I want you to consider that. You say, well, that preacher, you just, no, no, say what you like. I'm just trying to be honest with you. Yeah. What's important here? We need to have our kids grounded <laughs> in the truth of the scripture so they'll know what they're facing when time comes. Mm -hmm. By the way, not only does that hold true when we come to church, but in our homes, that ought to be the foundation. Scripture ought to be taught in our homes right. as well. You go all the way back to Deuteronomy chapter 6, you'll see that's where the responsibility truly lies, is in the home. Okay? So what does a church do? Okay? First of all, a church goes. Goes. Okay? Now, some of you came today, which I'm, I'm glad. Well, I guess all of you came today. Didn't you? <laughs> Had to. But you know, it's not just about this building and us sitting together under this roof. It's about also going when we go out. What we get here, we are not meant to take it. You know, that message the preacher preached today, I'm going to tuck it right there and I ain't telling nobody about it. That's not what it's for. Right. The message from the Word of God that we get is something that we're to share yeah. with others around us. Not because uh, your preacher preached it. Or not because you think or may not think that your preacher is a great preacher. You know, it's not about the preacher. It's about the message. Right. And the man should never overshadow the message. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. Ever, ever, ever. And when we see 
that a church goes, a church ought to go to the uttermost. You know, the Bible tells us in the first, uh, first chapter of the book of Acts, in verse 8, that Jesus says, But ye be, be witnesses unto me in Judea and Samaria and, uh, I missed one, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. Which that means Jerusalem is right here. Judea and Samaria were the area around Jerusalem and the area outside of Jerusalem and then up uttermost parts of the earth. Where do we go with our message? We are to go to the uttermost. We are to go to everywhere we go. We need to be packing the message of Jesus Christ with us. Amen. Everybody that we encounter, they need to know that there's something different about us. They need to know that there's something that we have in the, in the, in the fact that when we trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior, we got the gift of eternal life by faith. That they need to know that they can get that too. Right. And they need to be able to see us. Let me ask you this question. Commercials on TV. Uh, you ever see a commercial for a toy on TV? And probably not as much toys anymore as it used to be. But you ever see a commercial on to uh, for a, a, a toy on TV and a kid hates the toy? You ever seen that? He just absolutely hates that toy. Throws it down. I don't want nothing to do with that. Is that is that going to help that that toy get sold anywhere? No. No. What? Man, that kid's out there having fun. Well, being on a commercial, we don't know if he has, likes it or not, but somebody's getting paid for him to like it. So he's playing with it, and he's, that's, what, that's what sells that toy, right? Folks, if we act like we love what God has done in our lives, maybe, just maybe someone else will want that. Amen. That's what it means by going. And listen, ain't nobody here getting paid by nobody to act like a Christian. Right. Jesus Christ paid that price. Amen. Amen. Okay? And, yeah, hey, listen. Now, now, the benefits that we have after this life, they're pretty cool. And there ought to be an incentive Amen. for the fact that we know that we're going to go be with the Lord. We will escape death, hell, and the grave as right. a result of what He's done for right. us. But listen, if we are going around all long-faced and moping and, and, and fussing and cussing and carrying on all the time, they're going to go, that's a miserable person. Why would I want to be anything like them? So listen, when we go, let's go to the uttermost. Let, 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 let's let the people around us know that, man, we love the Lord. We, we, we've got the Lord, and He's got us. And, and I want you to have Him too. Uh, but you've got to want to have Him. But I, I want to show you how wonderful He is. I heard someone say just the other day about somebody that I know. That when they walked in the door, they didn't know what to expect. But when they sat down with him, they said, that person just wanted to talk to me about Jesus. Yeah. And you want amen on that? Amen. amen. Yeah. I want to talk about Jesus. Any number of things that could have been talked about. Is there anything really more important in your life than Jesus as a child of God? So when we go, we need to go to the uttermost. Just like we see this list of people here. All these people that have been mentioned here they have went or are going sometime in their lives. The apostles, they went all over the place and shared the gospel. The prophets, especially in the Old Testament, they went all over the place sharing the message of God. Today, evangelists, pastors, and teachers are sharing the gospel message everywhere they go. Amen. So we go to the uttermost. Also, we go unconditionally. What reason do we have to go? Do we have to go because God's been good to us this week? Let me tell you. I want you to find me a week that God has been good to. Amen. Amen. Does He love us based on our ability and our willingness to serve Him? Absolutely not. He loves us. He loved us when we weren't anything to Him, if you will. Right. He loved us when we were lost and undone and on our way to a devil's hell and we didn't speak on His behalf or for Him or in His favor in any way, shape, or form. But He still reached out to us and offered us the free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. He loved us even before we were. But God commended His loving toward us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. The Bible says in Romans 5. We go and share the gospel unconditionally. Who deserves to hear the gospel? I can answer that question really easy. Nobody. Everybody. You get me? Right. 
Nobody deserves the gospel. We all deserve to die and go to hell. Right. Amen. All of us. But yet everybody deserves to hear the gospel because Jesus Christ tasted death for every man. Right. Amen. Amen. So unconditionally, we don't look at somebody and go, I don't know if that person can be saved or not. I'll I, I tell you, it's really interesting. When I was younger, it's really interesting considering what's going on this week. Y'all know uh, the, the bike fest thing, right? When I was younger, I was thinking some of those bikers in those games, man, you couldn't you could reach those guys. They were just mean. They were just tough. They you yeah. No. It doesn't matter who they are. Right. It doesn't matter what they look like. It doesn't matter where they're from. It don't matter what they sound like. It don't matter what they act like. They all need Jesus. Amen. No matter what walk of life you're from. That's right. Okay? It was really funny. That yesterday, uh, Marsha and I were out for, uh, I guess it was lunch. I, I, don't, I don't remember what time. Well, I think it was lunchtime. And uh, I realized that uh, I was wearing jeans and a black T-shirt. And I've got this little thing on my chin. I, uh, I probably look like one of them bikers. Uh, well, I don't have any. Okay, so I get that. But the fact of the matter is, folks, we are not the ones who get to say you can be saved and you can't. Right. You know why? Because God didn't say that. That's right. It takes the death for every man. Okay? So the church goes to the uttermost and it goes unconditionally. Secondly, it grows. You know, that's what a church is supposed to do. I heard a fellow tell me the other day that they told their preacher, well, we, we don't do any outreach here. We don't, we're not going to do any outreach. And I said, well, what are they there for? What's their purpose? Why, why are they bothering? Are they, are they just a little get-together place? Are they just a little social club? Listen, while we're here, Jesus Christ fully intends for us to grow. Amen. Numerically, yes. Spiritually, absolutely. Amen. Now, listen, I hear missionaries say all the time, well, we didn't have a lot of numerical growth, but we had a lot of spiritual growth. That principle in itself is a good principle. But sometimes we use it to excuse our lack of doing what we're supposed to do. Okay? Listen, I love, I love our group of people here. I love, I love our members here at Bay Lake. And I love the people who love being here. And I love the people who come here. But if not for a moment, should we ever think that we're the only ones that belong here? Right. Never. You know? How would that make our visitors feel? Yeah, well, we're glad to see you. you know, whatever. No. Man, that makes our day when we see you walk through the door. Man, we're just, we're just tickled pink to see... Uh, uh, a new face or a face that, that, that recurringly comes and wants to be here with us, we're, we're glad to have you. We're glad to be able to share the gospel with you. We're, we're, we're glad to be able to love on you a little bit. <coughs> but a church grows in this respect. We look in verse 12 for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ that we henceforth no more be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies according to the effect of the working and the measure of every part make the increase of the body and the edifying of itself in love. First of all, a church grows unified. What is the purpose? We, we are all trying to get on the same page here. Okay? <laughs> right now, we should all be on the page that has uh, Ephesians chapter 4 on it. Right. Okay? I remember hearing the story back in the day when Brother Kirkland was here. He had an old Schofield Bible, and most everybody else had one too. So sometimes he would tell them just to turn a page. 1,372. And everybody would go there. You know? Now I you know I have a I think this is a Nelson that I have. It's a King James Bible. So uh, when you get there, it's going to say the same thing mine does as here's a King James Bible. But the fact of the matter is, is that we to be unified in what? <coughs> it says in verse uh, 12 or 13 rather. 
Till we all come in the unity of the faith. What's the faith? Okay? Now faith, we know what faith is. Faith is, is putting our trust in something. Okay? Faith is, uh, uh, does anybody know the, the definition of faith out of Hebrews 11 around the top of their head? The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Okay? So we know what, when we put our faith, we haven't seen Jesus Christ, but by faith we believe in Him. Amen. We know Amen. He's there. Some people might say, that's weak, that's unsubstantiated. I'm telling you, that's the only way it works. It's by faith. But the faith, when we see the term the faith, this is talking about the system of teachings of the Bible. Okay? What's the whole purpose of us coming in here together? For us to grow together in the strength and the teachings of the Word of God. That we might be able to not only learn more about the Word of God, but be able to teach others as we do what? Go. See, we go and grow simultaneously. Okay? As a matter of fact, you won't grow unless you go. Right. That's just, that's just not going to happen. So we see here, till you all come unified in biblical principles and, uh, uh, and, and the faith, it says. And it says, and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. That word perfect does not mean flawless. It has reference to maturity. Okay? If you've got a baby and... Uh, <clears throat> It, it's uh, it's on a bottle, and it gets to be 27 years old, and it's still drinking that same bottle. You're concerned, <laughs> right? And I don't mean to make fun of anybody that's not someone that you know what I'm saying. But that's the fact of the matter. Something doesn't seem to be right. Okay. So as children of God, folks, we ought to be growing. We ought to be learning more about God's word. We ought to be willing to step up and and be more available and and to and to serve and to work. Just as like uh, when we've got the uh, BDS coming up, and we've got positions that we've talked about. That's an opportunity to step up and to grow. Right. Is it uncomfortable? Sometimes. You know, Brother Bo, many of you know Brother Bo, him and I, on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we work out, not that you can tell. But we work out. And uh, one of us made a sound or something like that because we're getting older, I guess. And I said, they say no gain, no pain, right? Or, you yeah, know, pain, no gain. Whatever, yeah. No pain, no gain. So anytime it comes to growing, does anybody remember when they were kids and late at night, maybe you get in bed and your legs would hurt? Did mom ever tell you those were growing pains? Oh, good. That means my mama didn't make that up. She, she always used to tell me that. that. They're growing pains, you know. She must have known. She must have known what growing pains are. If you know my mama, she's that tall, right? So. It, it, sometimes it's uncomfortable when we when we grow, but look, one day you know, that's like uh, they said at Three Rivers where I was ordained many years ago. I came back one time and said, "Wow, he grew up to be a big preacher." I didn't know if they were talking about the fact that I was like a big preacher by like the name or by my size. I wasn't quite sure, you know. But the fact of the matter is, is that we are expected to grow as time goes on. So. We want to grow and, and be unified together. Same thing works with the family, folks. As you grow and mature and you're around those people, your relationship grows. It becomes stronger. Okay? You become more unified as a family. Not only does a church, a church grow unified, but it grows up. It, it grows up. This is the part that I struggle with from the standpoint of my life every day. Sometimes I just don't want to grow up. Anybody got that? I just don't I don't want to grow up. I, I still want to watch Saturday morning cartoons and eat a bowl of cereal while I'm doing it. I know, I haven't gone this far, but I know that they have onesies my size. And I, <laughs> I, I, won't, I won't do that. I won't do that. Uh, you know, with the feet in them and all that stuff. You know, I know. I won't do that. But the fact of the matter is I still want to be able to do, uh, retain some of that stuff that I do. I still want to get out and play basketball. My body says, no, you don't. But I, I say, yes, I do. And then it reminds me two days later, I told you, yes. you didn't want to do that. But at some point, there are some things that we have to relinquish and to grow in. We have to grow up. We have to start. My dad says, quit acting your age and not your shoe size. My shoe size, my shoe size is 12. And now I'm 52. I guess there's a little bit of time in there that I need to catch up to. 
you know? So we need to grow up in maturity. Well, how do we do that? Look here in this verse of Scripture um, down in, uh, let's see, verse, well, let's look here. We grow up in, in this sense. It says, verse 14, that we henceforth no more be children, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby we, they lie in wait to see, but speaking the truth in love. We grow in love. And we may grow up into all things, which is the head, even Christ. We need to be setting our sights on godly things, on the things of Jesus Christ. From the whole, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supply, uh, according to the effectual working of the measure of every part, make an increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. So we're in love, we're, we, we grow in love, we grow in all things, and we grow by the fact of increase in these things. You know, as you look back over your life, you'll see some things where you've grown up and you, you do things differently, you see things differently, and you handle things differently. So the church goes to the uttermost. It goes unconditionally. It grows unified, and it grows up. Finally, the church gives. This is a tough one for a lot of folks. The church gives. Guess what? The church also gives up. I don't mean throw up its hand and surrender, but I mean it gives up to people. Sometimes give up things, and this is the one thing that gets most people when you start talking about giving this up, giving that up. I want you to know something, folks. If you're here and you're not saved, and you, you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, nobody here is going to expect you to give up a single thing that you're doing right now. But if the Lord is speaking to your heart, and you know you're lost with that. And he is asking you to trust him. Guess what? When you trust him, those things which seem so important that were ungodly, they begin to change right. in your life. Amen. You know? When, it, when you start giving up things that were ungodly, and you realize, man, I didn't realize how much in love I was with those things and how much. They weren't good for me. And how much I, I, I didn't need to be involved in those things. Now I get it. Because the Lord Himself now lives within me. And He's showing me these things. Now I want to give them up. You know, someone told me one time, when you get saved, you want to get fixed. Right. Yeah. We, we, <coughs> we give up things. There's things that change about us. You know, I was saved four days before my 20th birthday. Things inside of me changed, even though I was acting church on the outside, probably just as good as anybody was that was doing it for real. But when uh, I talk about giving up things, what did that mean? I gave up putting on the mask and pretending to be somebody that I wasn't. It was now somebody that I that I that God wanted me to be, and I wanted to be that person. You say, preacher, well, don't talk to me about giving up stuff. Well, listen to child, listen here, child of God. If it's something that's ungodly according to Scripture, God's telling you what it is. God's telling you what it is. I, I may tell you from time to time because that's what a preacher does. If you got a preacher who won't preach against sin, you need to let him go and let him run for something somewhere. Okay? So the church grows up and the church gives it up. But the church also gives underpinning. Have you ever underpinned something or fortified something? First of all, we realize that the, the foundation of the church is Jesus Christ Himself. Right. That the Word of God is the pillar and ground of truth. Right. And on that are the people that are built by edification in that church to make the whole building fit together. The Bible says Jesus does that. But do you realize that there are sometimes, and I'm not a I'm not a builder in the sense of building stuff like this. I, you know, I'm the guy that has a hard time putting two boards together. I just it, I don't see it. I, it does it. I don't visualize it. Now I can I can cut a board for somebody and say, here, you know, give me the length. I can measure it, cut it, and I can nail it if they I know where to put it. You know, all that kind of stuff. I've done that stuff before. <clears throat> but the underpinning sometimes in building there will be something that standing alone. It may not have sufficient strength until you tie it into something else. 
You know, uh, you know, you got you got frame, uh, you got wall panels around the house. You know, you just stand one of those up and say, okay, let's build a house around that. That's probably not going to work too well. But once you start putting them on the sides and on the corner, and you stick the trusses on there and tie it all in together, then you got something that you can work with. You got some strength. Well, sometimes in a church, folks, by ourselves, we'll see that we are not strong enough to do it, and we'll need someone to tie on to, or someone to tie on to us, to help us, to encourage us, to strengthen us. Can I tell you, um, I've told you this before, I've had a preacher tell me that if you got a pet peeve, don't pet it. Don't pet your peeves. But this is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just stroke this one one time. When someone's doing something, and they're making an effort, and maybe they're struggling, maybe it's not just working out the way it should, this gets me quicker than anything. Well, they just don't know what they're doing. They ought to just give up because they're just... And they might be sweating and praying and trying to... If you want to help them, why don't you step up and say, Hey, can I, can I offer you some encouragement here? Hey, let me, let me come alongside of you and maybe tie in with you. And let's see if we can get this thing done together. That's what we need to be doing instead of pointing fingers and criticizing people in a way that would turn. The church is in the building business. Right. It's not in the demolition business. Right. It's me. Okay? So, a local, visible, New Testament church, such as, such as Bay Lake, the members of this church are to go. They're to go to the uttermost. Why? Because the people around us are valuable. How valuable are they? They're so valuable. Jesus Christ died for them. Amen. These people around us need us to go unconditionally. We can't go based on what they look like or where they're from. Right. They need Jesus Christ, and Jesus died for them. Amen. Right. A church grows unified in the Word of God. And we need to come together and, and, and be in agreement on the Word of God. As Baptists, that's what we are. We put it on the sign then we need to believe what the Bible says. Amen. And then we need to grow up. Sometimes we get we get acting like kids. That, that never happened in the Baptist church. Sometimes it does. But listen, even if sometimes we act like kids, we can get our stuff together and say, okay, it's time to grow up. Let's act like we're supposed to. Let's act like brothers and sisters in Christ and, and get things done. Finally, a church also gives up. There might be some things that God has laid on your heart to give up because it gets in the way of doing what you would have for Him, uh, have him have, that He would have you do in your life for Him. You say, Preacher, I don't want to hear about giving up anything. Well, I'll just let you talk to God about that. Right? That's between you and Him. Okay? But also, a church will give underpinning. And for those of us who feel like we may have our act together, and we see somebody who's struggling, let's go over there and tie into them Amen. and help them and encourage them. I'm going to tell you something. That's the only way this church has celebrated 127 years. It's the only way it'll celebrate 128. Amen. So today, if you're here, you're a member of this church, I want to encourage you. We are by no means close to being done here. <coughs> There's so much to be done and so many folks within reaching distance of us that need the gospel. Mm -hmm. We, we uh, you know, I don't know what the time limit is on a church. All I know is that in the Great Commission that we find in Matthew chapter 28, we can prepare for an invitation. Matthew chapter 28, it says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and I will be with you always even unto the end of the world. So you know when a church is done? When the world's over. 